This morning, I want to begin a new series entitled No More Excuses, and uh, this week and next, we'll finish it up next Sunday with part two. We're going to be looking at the, the story of Moses, going back into the early chapters of the book of Exodus and just looking at this great man, great faith, was not perfect. We have a lot to learn from him, and I think a lot of us can identify with his story. And so if you've got your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn there to Exodus 3 and 4. We'll go there in just a moment. But as you do that, I, I just want to say, you know, if, if you were really honest today and could look at your life, maybe you go back in time. Has there, has there ever been a time when you felt like God was calling you in just some profound way? Where, where God was asking you, he was leading you to do something. And, 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 and have, you, have you ever stopped and, and really thought about Maybe that was a, 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 a missed opportunity for you. Maybe it was, a, it was a moment where you did not fully step in. You didn't fully lean in. Have you ever thought about what it was that kept you from reaching that full potential that God had for you? I, I would almost guarantee this morning, if you were like me, that we can think back to, to times like that where we have been stretched, we have been challenged to grow or develop or do some great God thing, if you will, and we, and we didn't. We didn't maximize on that. We didn't fulfill that. And, and I would say for one reason or another, I think all of us could go back and we could think of some of the excuses that we used, some excuses that we leaned on that kept us from fulfilling that potential. And boy, we could talk a, about a lot of those today. We could talk about feelings of inadequacy and I could get a lot of amens in this room for that because a lot of us, all, we, we just feel like we're inadequate. We look around and we see, you know what, brother so-and-so could do it so much better than I could, Lord. Why don't you just, why don't you lay it on, on brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so? We look at ourselves and we look at our past failures. Anybody ever play this game? Boy, the devil's good at this. Boy, God could never use you. God could never use you after where you've been or what you've done. Moses, I tell you, he knew all the tricks. He, he knew all the excuses. And we'll get into that a little bit more next week. But it's a great story. It's found in Exodus chapters 3 and 4. And I want to I pick it up and see where Moses is living at this point in his journey with God. Remember the story of Moses. He was the, the baby found in the bulrushes, right? Uh, uh, the, the great story of, of his birth and how God protected him and literally for 40 years was raised up in Pharaoh's family as a part of the royal household. And he enjoyed all the privileges and the luxuries of being in Pharaoh's home. And yet as Moses grew up, he, he, he realized something wasn't right. With all the luxuries and all the life of ease, he knew deep in his heart he was, he was different. He wasn't an Egyptian. He was a, a Jewish man in a strange land. And no doubt as a young man, he looked around and he saw the slavery and he saw the oppression of his, of his people. And no doubt it, it stirred his heart in a profound way. Way. It so stirred his heart that one day Moses was moved so deeply by what he saw. He, he took the law into his own hands. And remember the story, he killed that Egyptian and buried his body in the sand. Moses saw this Egyptian overseer beating up on one of his Hebrew brothers. And he went out and he killed that Egyptian. And immediately upon doing this, he realized that he had been discovered. That his crime, if you will, his... His act had been discovered. It was no secret, and there were people that wanted to take his life, and so he, he runs. He flees from Egypt. He runs from, he leaves his power and influence and potential, and he ends up on the backside of a desert. And for 40 years, for 40 years, Moses chases sheep. For 40 years, he wanders in the desert as a shepherd. And boy, I guess if you really think about it, it was probably really good training <laughs> for what he was going to do with the rest of his life. In fact, I'm sure by the time the story picks up, Moses' dream 
if you will, had completely been dashed. I, I wonder if his memories of the palace had long since faded. And I suppose he probably came to a point where he never again saw himself as, as being the leader that as a young man he surely thought he would. D.L. Moody said once, this is a long time ago, but he said, Moses spent 40 years thinking he was somebody. And then he spent 40 years learning that he was nobody. And then he spent 40 years discovering what God can do with a nobody. And if you look at his life, it really is true what God can do with a person's willing heart. I want to talk about that today and next week. Let's talk about Moses and let's talk about his imperfections. I want to have an honest conversation with you and just look at his inadequacies and let's focus on, on God and his adequacy. You see, that's, that's how the story always has to go because the reality is we're all nobodies, but we're nobodies that when the power of God is infused can can really do some remarkable things if we let him. Can I get an amen today? Are you, are you awake this morning on this beautiful Father's Day? Let's pick it up. In Exodus chapter 3, it's the story of the, of the burning bush. And from the burning bush, there are three lessons I want us to talk about. Let's dive into Scripture first and read verses 1 and 2. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock, listen, to the far side of the wilderness. I, I think that's not only geographically and factually true, but there's also some, some symbolism there. He was on the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And there the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Now, that's interesting as we begin this story and we see here what's happening as the, as the picture, as the imagery kind of is painted before us. And, and we begin to see the first important lesson, and that is, number one, God appears in ordinary things. God often appears in the ordinary, in the things that we might ignore, in the things that we might think are insignificant. God appears in the ordinary. He comes to us in ordinary situations and, and only like God can do, he, he does extraordinary things. In this setting, God used a, a bush. It's kind of remarkable to think about it. I, I heard it said once, I can't remember where I heard this, but, but somebody said, and I liked it, any old bush will do as long as God is in it. And boy, that's true in this, in this case. Any old bush would work as long as God was in it and God was in this bush. Now, let me give you some insight about where Moses was in his personal journey at this time. It, it doesn't say this in Exodus 3, but later in the book of Exodus, it tells us that Moses had two children. He had two children. His first child's name was Gershom. Boy, that's one I haven't heard in a while. Gershom was his name. And, and Gershom literally means, if you translate that into the culture of the times, Gershom means stranger. Stranger. Now, now, the Hebrews, when they would give names to their children, I think I've shared this with you before, they wouldn't do so haphazardly. When a name was given to a child, there was always a purpose behind it. There was a, there was a message behind that name that was given. You know, when we name our kids today, we just tend to kind of go through, have you ever had the name book? Have you used that? Well, now it's probably online. You don't need to have a book. You just look online and you go through this list of thousands of names and you find one that kind of sounds cool to you, right? I don't know about you, but when we were naming our kids, it, you always wanted to rule out the names of those in your history that you didn't, the, the names of people you didn't like. You said, boy, I don't want to think of that person every time I see my kid. So we try to rule out those names, but we try to think of a name that's cool, you know, and a name that we like. And we get all kinds of even more unique names today than ever before, I suppose. But, but a name for the Hebrews was very significant. For example, back in the story of Abraham and Sarah and had a son Isaac. Isaac's name literally meant, many of you know, it meant laughter. 
And, and, and the reason they named him Isaac was because when they were, they were so old that when they got the message they were going to have a child, they literally burst out laughing because they thought it was so utterly ridiculous. And that's where his name came from. So the first son of Moses, whose name was Gershom, means stranger. Now that's probably fitting when you begin to think about where Moses was in his life journey at the time. He felt like a, a stranger out there. I, I don't belong here. Something isn't right about where I am in my life on the backside of a desert. Now, interestingly enough, Moses also had a second son. And the second son's name was Eliezer. I think I'm pronouncing it right, Eliezer, which also has a profound meaning. It means the God of my fathers has become my help. Well, you can say a lot in the name, can't you? That's why it has so many, uh, that has so many syllables. Eliezer, the God of my fathers has become my help. And if you think about his second son's name, that also is very significant because in the 40 years on the backside of the desert, Moses began to change. His heart began to change. God began to work in his life and the hand of God begins to move and Moses begins to understand that God isn't finished with him yet. That God has something else that even in these 40 years of waiting, it seemed like a waste of time, I suppose, but Moses began to realize that God had a plan. God begins to teach Moses things until his second child's birth. And he's saying, now, not I'm a stranger. All is lost. There's no hope. I feel like I don't have a clue. To all of a sudden, he's saying, the God of my father's has become my help. In other words, he's saying, now I'm beginning to understand that God is up to something. I begin in the middle part of verse 2 as we continue reading. I know I read this a moment ago, but let's do that again. Moses, as he was standing there, the bush had burst into flames. It says, Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. It's amazing how formerly Moses spoke to himself. Moses said, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. And when the Lord saw, this is a very important, when the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses! Moses, and Moses said, here I am. Now, I need you to underline that part of that verse that I highlighted to you because it really is key. I, I think it's fascinating. This phrase, when the Lord saw, when the Lord saw that he had turned toward the bush. What an interesting phrase. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to look, when he gazed upon that burning bush, God called to him from the midst of that burning bush and said, Moses, Moses, and Moses replied appropriately, here I am. And there's a sense here that we're off to an amazing start. I mean, that's the right answer, right? Here I am. And here we get the second lesson that we get from the burning bush, and that is number two. It is often difficult to get our attention. Wouldn't it be nice if when God had something to say to us, he didn't have to send a burning bush that was not consumed? Wouldn't it be nice if God would just call out in that still small voice and we were astute enough and attuned enough to, to be able to recognize his voice? But you know, I, I found even in my own life that sometimes God has to work harder than he should to get my attention. It's often difficult to get our attention. Somehow in the midst of life, God has to get our attention. And boy, sometimes when, when he does get our attention, it can be a fairly painful process. You know what I'm talking about? We make it hard sometimes. And only when we focus on God and we turn our eyes on him is he able to present himself to us. But it is only at that time when our eyes are on him 
He's able to teach us, speak to us. Now, you have to understand, I have no doubt that Moses had walked by this bush or maybe a million bushes like it in his lifetime. This bush was nothing special. It was just a part of the scenery, just like you walk down the street. How many of you notice every bush you see? We walk by a lot of things. We don't pay any attention. I'll, I'll go as far to say as, you know, I really doubt that even a burning bush was really that big of a deal to Moses. I mean, he's in the middle of the desert, and I'm sure just like today, things burn from time to time. I'm sure he'd seen lots of bushes go up in smoke before. A burning bush wasn't even a a big deal. But this day he stops. And the reason he stops and the reason he notices this particular bush is it is on fire, but it is not being consumed. That's what makes the difference. There's something profound about this bush that seems to not burn up. It continues to burn, yet continues to exist. And it was at that moment, it was in that extraordinary moment that this bush was burning that Moses stopped and he focused, laser focused on that bush. And the moment he focused on God, don't miss this, the moment he focused on God, God began to speak. Don't forget that, church. Because I I think God has a lot to say to us. But I think we're missing it because we're not really focused on him. This morning in the early service, we sang that old hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. Some of you know that song. And what a beautiful segue into this conversation. You know, sometimes we just need to focus on him. And God begins to speak. Now, sometimes God uses incredibly ordinary things, people, events, times, and and does extraordinary types of things to get our attention because we have a, a tendency, I think we're getting at this today, we have a tendency to walk through life paying little attention to the familiar. That's exactly what was happening here. But God said, Moses, I, I need to talk to you. And in order for me to get this message across, you, you've got you've to look at me, brother. I need you to focus in on me. And some of you, maybe this morning, without getting too personal, without, without trying to play prophet too much today, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if, if you've walked into this sanctuary this morning and, boy, what a good-looking group you are. I mean, you got your nice clothes on. You're looking sharp and spivy. Never seen a better-looking crowd in my whole life. But I wouldn't be a bit surprised that some of you walked in here this morning and even though you look great, you got a smile on your face you got burning bushes in your life. There's some stuff going on. God is trying to get your attention. And maybe, maybe I I don't relish in this. Maybe you're going through some kind of a crisis even at this moment. Maybe you've gotten some bad news. You know, fill in the blank. All the different ways that God tries to get our attention. And oftentimes we stubbornly say, no, God, I'm not looking at that bush. I don't know what your burning bush is, but I bet there are people here today and you're not wanting to listen to this because this is talking about right where you are and there's a burning bush and God is speaking. God is wondering, what is it going to take to get you to focus on me. All I'm saying is you're never going to learn from him until you can see him, until you focus on him, and you're not going to see him until you give him your attention. Sometimes that's when the things of this world grow strangely dim, if you know that song. Well, here's another lesson from the burning bush. Let's look at verse 5 first. Verse 5 sets the stage for us. So the bush is burning. God has called out to Moses. Moses says, here I am. God says, do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place you are standing is holy 
ground, and that leads us to that third point, that third thing we learn from the burning bush, and that is in God's presence, the ground is always holy. Did you know that? I think some of us get this kind of confused. Uh, sometimes I think it's good to be reminded that we are the church, right? This building is not the church. It is just a convenient location that we come together. This church was built by human hands. There is nothing that we can do to make this place holy. I mean, we could light incense in here and we could have smoke and we have we real cool lighting and we can have real neat effects, but it isn't going to make it holy. There's only one thing that makes it holy, and that's when God shows up here. Amen. And what's really interesting about that, being reminded that we are the church, the Bible talks about that, about being the temple of the Holy Spirit, that that God literally lives in us through his Holy Spirit. And that means wherever we go, wherever we take him, that ground is holy too. When we come to the presence of God, you know, you can do that driving your car down the interstate. I just encourage you to keep your eyes open as you're driving. Maybe you're in your bedroom or in the office, in the backyard, sitting by the lake, in a beautiful spot, whether it's there, maybe, you know, every once in a while, God even shows up here. Amen? No matter where it is, when we come into his presence, oh, there's a holiness and there's an awesomeness. There's a power and a reverence that only God can bring. Now, in that next verse or those next verses, I I see four things that I can learn and know about God based on what's happening here as this story continues to unfold. In verse 6, this is where where he says, I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so the first thing that we can know about God, and this is good, you you need to remember this, and that is, number one, God has been faithful to past generations. And that's exactly what was happening here is Moses was getting a bit of reminder about who God was, getting a reminder of his, of his nature. And, and, and not only was God Moses enabler, he was his help, but he was being reminded that God was also the God that helped the previous generations. Moses, I've taken care of Abraham. I, I took care of Isaac. I, I took care of Jacob. And, and, and just as I cared for them and all those who came before you, I'm, I, I want you to know, Moses, I'm going to be here for you too. You know, that's a simple truth, but it's, it's one that has a profound impact. You know, things are, things are crazy nowadays, right? I mean, we have seen all kinds of things. We've lived through a year and a half of of things that makes our our heads spin. There's a chaotic world around us, and I suppose that's nothing new. It's just the circumstances are in more intense, perhaps, than they've ever been. But you know, one of the things that gives me great comfort is I, as I look in Scripture and I see how God has been faithful to the generations. And, and you know the reality? He's, he's been faithful from, from the very beginning. In fact, I, I love the first four words of Scripture. In Genesis 1, 1, you know what those first four words are? In the beginning, God. You know, what a great way to start the story of God, to know that in the beginning God was there and he has been faithful ever since. And because he was there then and he's been there every step along the way, I know he's here now and he's going to be there for me tomorrow. We serve a God who's been faithful to the past generations. Number two, we know that God knows what is happening in your life. And sometimes we just need to hear this. Again, not profound, but sometimes we just need to hear that God knows what you're going through. There there is nothing that you are facing today that has caught him by surprise. Now, the problem is that sometimes we have some pretty difficult things happening and we look around in the midst of that pain, not being able to sense God in the way that we would like. And we've, we've all asked the question, God, where are you? 
God, are, 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 you, are you there? Look with me in, the, in, in verse 7. I'm just going to read verse 7, or I'm, I'm going to pick out some key phrases that show this very point, that God knows what's happening. Look what he said there. It says, and the Lord said, I have surely seen the misery of my people. He's saying, I know what's going on. I'm aware of what's happening. He also says in verse 7, I, I, I hear their cry. God is fully aware. It's not like he just kind of went somewhere else and forgot about the children of Israel. He says, I am concerned about their suffering. You see, the reality is God knows what's happening. Just, just because you may not hear him speaking at the moment doesn't mean he's not aware. In fact, I have found in some of the most difficult moments that I have had to enter into, there are sometimes I'm called into situations as a pastor where I have no words. You ever been in one of those? If you try to manufacture words, it would just come off badly. The most powerful thing in some of those situations, you know what I'm about to say. It's not what I said. It's that I was there. You see, and some of you may, you may not be able to hear God's words right now, but what you do need to know is that he is there. And he is fully aware. I hear their cry. I'm concerned about their sufferings. Look at verse 9. I have seen the oppression. I've seen it. I've heard them. I'm aware of it. God knows what is happening. He's fully aware. Now, what I wanted you to to know is significant. It's been going on a long time. God says, I know this has been a long journey. In fact, it's a longer journey than most of us can even wrap our minds around. Because a lot of scholars think this had... This had been going on for nearly 400 years. Remember how this all started, right? Remember how those Israelites ended up in this mess? It all started with Joseph. It was his fault, right? You remember Joseph? Well, it wasn't his fault. It really was his brother's fault because they sold him into slavery. They didn't like Joseph. They were jealous of him. They sold him into slavery. He ends up in Potiphar's house. That's how the Israelites first got foot in Egypt. Remember the story? And then there was this incredible famine in the land, and we know that whole story about Joseph and his brothers, and pretty soon the whole family ended up down there, and they all went down there because there was this incredible famine in Israel, and so Joseph had created this great storehouse of food, and so There's this weird irony that the Israelites ended up in Egypt to be rescued. And those 70 that started there turned into, oh, there's all kinds of different counts, a million, two million, a lot. In fact, there were so many Pharaoh became intimidated by the way that the Israelites continued to grow and that that's how they ended up in slavery. That's how they ended up in bondage. They were prospering so much and so they were oppressed so they could not revolt and take over. For something like 400 years, God had seen their affliction. He had heard their cry. He was aware of their opposition. And now we're beginning to see God move. And some people are saying, well, it's about time. That leads us to number three. God will act in his perfect timing. You see, that really speaks to me when you talk about the timing of God. You, you may not have this problem, but your pastor has this problem. I'm just going to make it personal today. When I, when I talk to God about an issue or a problem, I, I always give him an out. It's very gracious of me, isn't it? You know, God, I, I got this issue, and I, you don't have to answer right now. You can wait till this evening if it's more convenient. I tell you what, I'll give you till tomorrow, Lord. If that's what it takes, I don't want to be pushy. You don't want to be impatient, but God, I got a problem, and you got all day. Have you been there? Too many times. 
400 years those Israelites have waited. 400 years. God's seen, he's heard, he knew, he was concerned, and there's just something comforting. I know 400 years seems absurd, but there is something comforting about the reality knowing that God never took his eye off them. He knew what was going on. He was doing a work even when they didn't see it. There's something comforting about the fact that God was in control of that whole arduous process. God is aware and God sees. Verse 8, God said, I have come to deliver them and to bring them up from that land. Now we're being rescued from the place they were rescued to. There's the irony. I'm going to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, which of course we know is the land of Canaan. Verse 10, he tells Moses, so now go. God will act in his perfect timing. It won't be your timing, and it won't be mine. It will be his. And number four, God will often deliver his people by using other people. And this is where the mood music in the story of Moses begins to change. Because this was not the answer that Moses was looking for. God will deliver his people by using other people. And this is where really, folks, we have a great reminder of our responsibility. This is the heart of the lesson. You see, lesson number four is God is going to use people. Look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. So now go. He's talking to Moses. I am sending You, I am sending you, Moses, to Pharaoh, back to where you came from. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, I did some some studying here. You know, we... We see the story unfold. God is in a burning bush. God says, I am who I am. He means he's he's giving all these wonderful things. Moses is on holy ground, takes his shoes off. He says, this is the most amazing experience of my life. Now, it doesn't say that, but I'm, I'm reading between the lines a little bit. I mean, it had to be. It had to be powerful. Wow, this is awesome, God. I love this. I'm talking to God in a burning bush. God says, I'm going to deliver my people. And boy, when he heard that, Moses had to just hit the roof. He's been waiting for this his whole life. It's been a dream since I was a kid to see our people released and delivered. God, I'm finally going to see it 400 years later. You're going to do something. It's about time. I'm so happy. Get them, God. Obliterate those Egyptians. And God says, I will through you. And the music changes. I did a little research in the original language there and where where it says you in the original Hebrew. Can I tell you what that means? You. You can look it up in the Greek, and it'll say the same. It's you. You can look it up in Aramaic. It's you. Every single language. The answer is you, Moses. And look what Moses does. He does just what we often do. Moses finds out that God wants him to do it. Are you kidding me? Okay, Lord, let me give you my list of reasons why you don't want to use me, and we'll get into that next week. He's got quite a list. I I just love it. Moses, one of the greatest leaders of the Old Testament. Boy, we're going to look back at him and say he's a tremendous leader. Boy, he didn't start off so great. He starts off his leadership by telling God all the reasons he couldn't, shouldn't, didn't, and wouldn't. Isn't it marvelous? This is what I love about the Word of God. You know, if I was writing writing the Bible, I would tend to kind of make it all fairy tale. Boy, when the, hero, the heroes are heroes, you know? 
They, they always get it right. They always hit a home run. But boy, that's what I love about this scripture. To me, it gives it even more credibility because we are given the story. We are given the accounts of people just as they were. And boy, they're just like me. And next week, we'll pick it up here. We'll look at the excuses that Moses gave to God and how God still found a way to use Moses to lead his people on to freedom. But before I close, I want to bring this point home for just a moment. I want you to think about Moses. I want you to, I want you to think about his attempt to get out of what God was calling him to do. Think of how God would later use Moses. And Moses, boy, at every turn, oh God, you've got the wrong guy. Can you take just a minute and look at your own life? I mean, this is an amazing story, but the application is also amazing. What is God calling you to do? What has God been trying to get you to do? What, what has he been calling you to do? Where has he been leading you? In what areas is he prodding you? I, I tell you again, I believe with all my heart, it's been my experience, God is a God who speaks. If we'll focus on him, he speaks. He's prodding you and you're resisting him. Maybe you're making excuses. You're, you're putting him off. You're dodging the issue. You say, I don't want to hear it, God. God has been trying to get your attention. Burning bushes everywhere. Well, you wake up in the morning, you almost trip over them. Oh, but you put on the blinders. Nope, I didn't see that, Lord. You got the wrong number. All because you were scared, intimidated, uncertain. How is this going to work out? I don't have all the answers. I can't see all the way to the end, Lord. Oh, I know this well. I've, <laughs> I've done it my share of times. Church, look at what God wanted Moses to do. Look, look at the difference. Most of you know the end of the story. Look at the difference Moses made when he finally said yes. Look at how God took care of him. Look at how God provided for him. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what God would accomplish if every single one of us quit making excuses and simply did what he's telling us to do? Can you even begin to imagine what a difference it might make well, just bring it home. It's Father's Day. Dads, listen. Can you imagine the difference it would make? Dads, if you would just begin to do in your family what God is calling you to do. You've been given incredible responsibility for your family to lead your family spiritually, yet so many dads, they're not really doing it. They're letting mom do it. What's not been being done at all. Can you imagine the difference it would make? How about it, folks? No more excuses. You can write this next statement down because I believe it with all my heart. God isn't going to give us more until we obeyed what he's already given us. You see, a lot of times we'll sit back and we know what we're supposed to do. We didn't do it, so we're waiting on God to give us an out. He's not going to do it. He's not going to give us more till we've obeyed in those areas he's already spoken. It's, it's time to submit. It, it, it's time to quit holding back. It's time for action. And this morning as we close, I want to pray with you and for me, I want you to ask God to reveal to you those areas where you have not fully obeyed his voice. 
Oh, I tell you, he'll show you. If you'll focus on him, he'll speak. The Holy Spirit's job is to convert, confirm and convict. He'll do it. He'll show you. Let's do it. Father, I thank you for your word today. It's a simple message, really, but how profound the story of Moses by simply giving his attention to, to what God had put in his path. You spoke and Oh, there were stops and starts. It certainly wasn't a perfect journey. We're going to see Moses and all of his humanity. But in, in the end, God, we find a heart that was willing to go after you and a, a heart that was willing to say yes, a, a heart that was willing to, to focus in on the voice and be obedient. And, and what an amazing story we have as Moses sees his people He's key to the process of seeing his people rescued and onto the promised land. Lord, I'm just wondering this morning if you, if you would reignite some burning bushes in our life. Some maybe that we've ignored for a long, long time. If you would help us to take off the spiritual blinders and focus on what you're trying to say to us. And I bet we'd be surprised how you'd speak to us. And I bet we'd be surprised how you open doors and how you lead us and how you bless us and how you take us to places to accomplish things that we could never do on our own, but because of you, being given permission in our life amazing things are accomplished oh God make it so in us give us a heart to focus on you and to follow you Lord thank you for this time today you're good to us we love you pray a blessing on our fathers this morning may we lead our families well and would you help us <laughs> Oh, help us to focus on you today. In Jesus' name.